it's Advent. And Advent reminds us of Christ's coming. Advent means coming or arrival. And during Advent, the very first season on the church's worship calendar, during Advent, we look with anticipation to celebrate Jesus' first coming and we look with expectation and hope for his second coming. So it's about celebrating Christ's coming, Christ's arrival. And I trust that as we look into God's word this morning, as we wait upon him, that God by his spirit may challenge each of us as to how we may celebrate, expect, hope for, look forward to his coming, both at Christmas and his coming again. So to that end, let's ask his blessing on his word this morning. Shall we pray? Lord, we wait upon you. We wait for your word. We wait for your direction and instruction. We await your strength and enabling that we may be obedient to fulfill your word. That we may be responsive to the call of your word. That we may experience the fulfillment of your word. So Lord God, may the words of my mouth, may the thoughts and reflections of our hearts all together be found acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So on this first Sunday in Advent, as we join with the business and professional women in their observance against gender violence. I want to speak this morning on the subject, watch. Watch. I'm not talking about this kind of watch here. You know what they say about pastors that say, I'm going to take off my watch so that I don't go over time. You know what they say about pastors like that? Preachers like that? Don't take them seriously. <laughs> Don't take them seriously. So I'm not talking about this kind of watch. For if God's word to us this morning is meaningful and effective, it really doesn't matter whether that word is delivered in five minutes or 50 minutes. But I'll get you out of here before midnight. <laughs> we, won't, we won't be here until midnight this evening I can guarantee you that <laughs> we're reflecting then on the words read for us from Mark's gospel chapter 13 and if you have your Bibles turn again to Mark's gospel chapter 13 we're talking about watch and in chapter 13 of Mark's gospel Mark, the apostle, captures an exchange that Jesus has with his disciples in which Jesus is telling them of some of the signs that will mark his return. He's talking about the things that will unfold in preparation for his coming. So throughout the chapter, he talks about false messiahs that will rise up, claiming to be him. For example, in verse, chapter, in verse 6 of the chapter, he says, Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. Look out, watch out, he says, for some like that. 
He talks about conflict on a global scale, wars and rumors of wars are the words Mark uses to describe them. He talks about conflict on a domestic scale, brother against brother, father against child, domestic violence. And he's not really just, you know, maybe we're saying to ourselves, but those things have been going on a long time. And those things are not really not strange. What is Jesus through Mark really talking about? And I want to suggest that he's really talking about an intensity of these things. That as the time approaches for the end of the age and his second coming, that these things will grow in intensity. These conflicts on a global scale. These conflicts on a domestic scale. These false messiahs. Persecution of his followers, he speaks about in this passage. Talks about changes in outer space that will affect the sun, the moon, the skies. All in increasing intensity. Then he talks about his dramatic and great and glorious reappearance. And he punctuates what he's saying as he's talking to his disciples about these signs of the end times. He punctuates what he's saying with these words of warning. Watch out. You must be on your guard. Be alert. Watch out. It's as if he wants his readers to take careful note of what he's saying. He says these things to his disciples. They are passed down through the gospel writers and they are as important to, is to us as they were to his disciples. Then, they are as important to his disciples now as they were to his disciples then. Watch, he says. Be alert, he says. Be on your guard. Look out. Watch. One of the things that he seems to be emphasizing in this discourse is that no one really knows the precise time when I will return. Jesus wants to make it very clear that although we can tell the signs and that we must watch for them, we cannot tell the exact time when he will return. So all the more reason why we need to have a, an attitude of watching, of careful observation to the signs that we may be in readiness for his coming. And then he closes the discourse with this parable, this little story in the closing three verses of the chapter. It's like a man, he says, going away. He leaves his house and he puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task. And he tells the one at the door, keep watch. The others have other responsibilities. Maybe there's one to cook and maybe there's one to, to, to clean the toilets and maybe there's one to do other things. Each one has an assigned task and together they are watching over the master's place. But each one has a place in that overall responsibility of stewardship for the master's place. As we look at this parable, as we look at this discourse that Jesus has, and a discourse which I, I might add reappears in others of the Gospels. So in Matthew's Gospel, in Luke's Gospel, we see the same discourse. Jesus preparing his disciples for his second return. 
and for the consummation of the age, the final coming together. And Christians believe that first of all, this second coming really signals a new beginning, a new heaven and a new earth. And for that reason, it is something to, to look forward to with expectation and longing. Because it's going to signal a change. It's going to bring good things. But as Christians, we also believe that it's going to be a time of reckoning. A time of accounting. A time of placing before God what we have done with our lives on this earth. What and how have we lived our lives doing? Jesus wants us to therefore have an attitude, a posture, an orientation of watching. What is it that he wants us to watch? I want to suggest three things emerge out of this passage that he wants us to be watching for. First of all, watch if you are one of the master's servants. Watch. Be in a place of readiness, being careful to consider whether you are part of the master's household. And in verse 27, he says, and he will send his angels and gather his elect. And in fact, throughout this passage, he uses that expression, his elect. The picture that is conveyed in that expression, elect, is really a picture of choosing, a picture of selection, a picture of those who are numbered with those with who will experience what it means to be in the, the master's household. The real question is, so, so who are a part of this elect? Romans says this to us, Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 to 13. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all. And everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The writer of John puts it this way. For all who received him to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. As we express our trust in Christ and we receive him as our Savior and Lord, we become a part of his elect, of his selected, of his household. And so as we watch to wonder if we are in the select, we must ask ourselves the question, have I confessed Christ as Savior? Have I believed him to be my Lord? Have I received him to be such? Am I a Christ follower? So we are to watch if you are one of the master's servants. But then secondly, we must watch out for the signs of the master's coming. That's very clear 
in this passage why he's outlining all these things, indicating the signals that point to his return. And each day as we live, we have to ask ourselves, are we beginning to see some of those signs in our day and age? Is there an intensifying of some of these signs that he talks about in Mark's gospel here and repeats in, in the other gospels? Is there a sense in which these global conflicts are intensifying? Is there a sense in which domestic conflicts are intensifying? Is there a sense in which things happening in the cosmos see, that seem to be increasingly strange and increasingly happening? Things we can't explain. Things just seeming to be out of whack. Climate changing. Earth heating up. Things are happening that are changing the orientation of our universe. Watch! For we must ask ourselves the question, what time is it? How close is his coming? And how prepared am I for that second coming? But then the third thing that we need to ask or we need to watch out for. Watch out that you are carrying out your assigned task. Verse 34, we are reminded in this parable that those who are a part of the master's household, who the master has left in the household to take care while he's away, have been assigned different tasks, each with his assigned task. For there is a purpose why we are here as church. There is a mission that Christ has left us to carry out. And as we carry out that mission, each of us has a task, has a responsibility. Every Christ follower has an assigned task in the master's mission. And the master's mission is for the world to come to know him. For men and women, for boys and girls to have a relationship with him. For the world to experience God's love and God's justice and God's care and God's righteousness. And each of us who are a part of the household of Christ are called to carry out that mission. Each of us has an assigned task in fulfilling that mission. It's not just about keeping church. It's about reaching the world for the master. So each of us have to ask ourselves the question, how Am I helping others to come to know him? I was talking to a church gathered yesterday for their praise and thanksgiving banquet, they call it. I was talking to them about how do we share the gospel in a radically fast-changing world. How do we share the gospel? This is our mission. This is our task. But there are so many things happening in our world that are creating barriers to the gospel. We live in a much more skeptical age where some of the questions that probably some years ago wouldn't be even present are very much on the front burner of people's minds. And as we share the gospel, if we are not answering some of those skeptical questions, some of those tough questions about different religions, tough questions about evolution, tough questions about where did the Bible come from, 
tough questions about who is this Jesus? Did he really live? If we are not answering some of those questions, we are unable to speak to this generation that has those genuine questions. How are you helping others to come to know him? How are you equipping yourself to respond to some of those questions when others who are searching ask you those questions? Or maybe you are like many of us. Once we know somebody is a questioning person who has some deep, difficult questions, some questions that you and I can't answer, once we see them coming, we just take off. We don't want to meet that person at all. We don't want to confront them. We don't want to confront their questions because we don't know the answers. And we have not disciplined ourselves to seek out the answers that are there. But we have not disciplined ourselves to seek those answers so that we may, with confidence, present why we believe what we believe. And why we recommend to other persons, a faith and a relationship with Jesus. Are you helping others to come to know him? Are you helping to reach the world for the master? Do you know what your assigned task is? For you know, as I like to say, pew warming is not one of them. I look through my Bible and I, you know, I see you know, all kinds of other gifts, spiritual gifts, other ministries and so on. But guess what? I never see anywhere bench warming. It's not one of them. There is an assigned task that you and I have to tell us about Christ. There is an assigned task that you and I have to help the world to know about Jesus' love and his justice, and his care, and his righteousness. And as you and I live day by day in our communities, in our workplaces, in our families, we have opportunity to demonstrate and to model God's love and God's justice, God's care, and God's righteousness. What are you doing? To model that love and that care and that justice so that others may meet Christ. Maybe you are like some that Mark speaks about in this parable. He says, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows, or at dawn, if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Now, some of us going to sleep a long time. Ago. In fact, some of you might be sleeping right now. You're not even listening to what the pastor is saying. It's all over. <laughs> Just in case somebody's beside you dozing off, just give them a holy nudge. <laughs> Bring them back. Bring them back. And I promise you I'll hasten on so we won't be here much longer. But we'll get out of here before midnight. <laughs> what is your task? What is your assigned task? Are you sleeping on the job? Or are you fulfilling that task? As part of the household of the master. Reaching out to the world with the message of the master. Because I want to suggest, friends, that part of the task is to make our community a better place, is to make our community a safer place, is to make our community a place that challenges evil and stands up for what is righteous. So you and I need to watch out in our community this morning, particularly for the ugly head of violence. 
whether that violence expresses itself as gender against gender or whether it expresses itself in domestic conflict or whether it expresses itself in child and, and parent conflicts. You and I are called to be a part of what the business and professional women and other communi community groups are doing as they take steps to halt violence in our community. And what should we watch out for as we watch against, take a watch against gender violence and against violence in our community? Let me suggest, friends of all, friends, that you and I need to watch if you are part of the solution or you're part of the problem. Just as though we need to ask ourselves, am I part of the master's household? Am I part of the elect? Am I part of the Christ followers to whom he issues this mission? You and I need to ask ourselves, am I part of the peacemakers? Or am I part of those who are contributing to violence by my warsome spirit? By my conflictual attitudes, by my confrontational approach in dealing with matters. Somebody told me the other day that, Rev, I think people need to know about the business of the church. But you know something? I find it hard to come to congregational meetings because. There is so much conflict in the congregational meetings. It seems as if there is more infighting in the congregational meetings than in some other social club meetings. We who are supposed to be the peacemakers. Let me just hold that a little bit more. Are we on the bus? To bring solutions or are we a part of the problem? The challenge is to watch if we are part and to be a part of the solution. But we need to watch also for the signs of violence and abuse that are around us. According to the website for the Cayman Islands Crisis Center, domestic abuse is more common than many people think. More women seek medical services due to injuries from violent partners than from muggings, rapes, and automobile accidents combined. It's a problem. Over the past 10 years, says the website, calls to the crisis center have increased 200%. Usage rate of the crisis center is seven times higher than in similar jurisdictions in the U.S. And they give a listing of what they call red flags. Look out for these red flags in your relationships. And they give 11 red flags, but I was going to talk about four. They say, look out. For persons you are relating to who are quick to in get involved, come on very strong, but they quickly pressure you for an exclusive commitment. Pressure. Look out, for it could be a red flag about the likelihood of abuse and violence in your relationship. Look out for sudden mood swings, switches from sweetly loving to explosively violent in a matter of minutes. Look out for those red flags. Watch for the signs of violence and abuse. Look out for the one who wants to isolate you, who tries to cut you off from your family and your friends, who, try, who even tries to prevent you from holding a job. They'll take care of you so you don't have to work. What a life. <laughs> you know? On the surface, it, surface, it just looks like a nice proposition, eh? 
until you notice that every time you have to go to the shop, you have to get permission. And some people think that is only that can only happen to the woman in the relationship. You have some men in relationships who if they want a dollar, hey, they better behave themselves. <laughs> Watch out for this red flag. Cruelty to animals and children. They kill or punish animals. They may expect children to do things that are beyond their ability or tease them mercilessly. Look out for those red flags. Watch out for the likely signs of violence and abuse in your relationships. So we need to watch to see if we are a part of the problem or we're part of the solution. We need to watch to see if there are signs of violence and abuse in my relationships. And sometimes, we're looking for signs in the other person. But guess what the signs are? Right in me. So I need to watch for some of those signs in me. Watch out for what you do to reduce violence. What is your assigned task in the mission to reduce gender violence? Ask yourself. If you know you have an ang anger problem, you need to deal with it. The problem is with you. You need to deal with it. If you know that you're abusing your children, your task is to get help. That's your task. So that you are contributing to reduce gender violence. Studies indicate that children from abusive families are at greater risk for developing self-destructive behaviors. Whether it is depression and suicidal attitudes, whether it is self-hurt, or whether it is the tendency to abuse others. You see a lot of the bullying that is happening in schools? A lot of those bullies are victims of bullying themselves at home. Ask yourself, am I bullying my child? Am I abusing my child? Because in so doing, I might be creating the next abuser. The next bully. And of course, it is, the, it is the task of all of us, the business and professional women are reminding us, it is the task of all of us to change our mentality about domestic violence. For the mentality at the moment is, it's just a kind of aberration of our cultural reality. You know, people lose te their tempers and I've heard even people say, Darling, I love you. That's why I beat you. The business and professional women are saying, Not only is domestic violence unkind, domestic violence is a crime. It's not only unkind, it's not only debilitating, it is not only life threatening for some, it is criminal. Just as though if you saw somebody breaking and entering your neighbor's house, you might call the police. So we have to have the mentality when we see domestic violence before us to take action as we would for any kind of crime. Report incidents of abuse and domestic violence when you see it. So watch is the watchword today. Watch for Jesus' is coming. Watch for the tasks that he has set 
for you to tell the world about him. Watch for the task that he has set for you to make your community a safer place. Watch for the signs of violence and abuse that may be in your relationships. Watch for the signs of violence and abuse that might be in you. Watch for in so doing, you place yourself in a position to be in readiness for the master's coming. You place yourself to be in readiness for a better society, for better relationships, for whole persons coming out of our homes. So today, friends, as we start this Advent, let us look with anticipation for our time of celebration for Christ's first coming. But may we watch with expectation for his second coming. And as we watch, let us watch that we are part of his elect, that we are part of his household. As we watch, let us watch the signs of the time that we may know how close his coming may be. And let us watch that we may be doing the assigned tasks and not be sleeping. And may part of that task be the actions that you and I take to reduce and to report violence in our community. Stories told of a man who we'll just call Manly for this morning. Hard-working accountant who provided well for his wife and children. But Manly had an anger problem. And sometimes when the work really got hard, especially like this time of year now, all the ladies, all the persons who work in banks know that this time of year, tough, tough time. Some of you are working Hours on end in the bands. Right, Machina? <laughs> Hours on end in the bands. And when Mr. Mandel would come home on days like that, the children could pick up from a mile off. Okay? Stay far from daddy tonight. Because if they are watching television, and he comes and sits down with them, it won't be long before he gets upset with them about some foolishness. So when he comes home and he's in a mood like that, they just wait for the appropriate time and they just kind of take away themselves and just get out of his way. Because they know he's going to blow it. For they have experienced that when he blows it and he, he disciplines one of them in, in that state of anger, oh, he overdoes it. He goes too far. They have been victims of that loss of control. And even though he and his wife have a very private life. There have been occasions when they are having a dispute in their bedroom. When the dispute spills over beyond just harsh words to a few harsh fists. The wife has a little nurse friend down the road. So when she has some bruises, she goes to the nurse down the road. She don't bother go to accident and emergency. She don't bother go to her GP. She just go to the nurse down the road who will just fix her up. And she knows not only how to 
take care of the bruises, but she knows how to apply a little camouflage makeup so she can keep it quiet. Mr. Manley is a trusted co-worker who knows what's going on. Turns out that this co-worker is a church man. And this co-worker's church in collaboration with BWP or some other community group like that is organizing a seminar on anger management in their church. So his co-worker gets alongside Mr. Manley and says, Mr. Manley, I would really recommend this to you. I'll come and pick you up. We can go together. We can go and have a, you know, have a meal together, and then we just go and take in the seminar. Against all odds, Mr. Manley agrees to come to the anger management seminar that his friend's church is having in collaboration with the business and professional women. He comes to the seminar and there's something about the presentation, there's something about what happened that really just touches him deeply. And Mr. Manley makes one decision that is deeply significant. And the decision is this, he accepts that he has a problem and he decides to go and see a company. And as he meets with that counselor over the period of three, maybe four months, things begin to change for Mr. Manley. And on the occasion when he went with his friend to the church, he had met some other friends, some other men who were there, and his friends said, you know what? His friend, his co-worker, as well as some of these others, are inviting Manley to come to church. After, you know, months of them pursuing him, one day he decides, yeah, let me go and see what, what it's like. I did enjoy the seminar. You know, maybe the other things might not be too bad. He comes. He likes the music. He likes the people. They're so warm and friendly. You know, they don't have problems with their overheads. You know, you know, you know, you know. It just rarely flows. And the pastor preaches a good message and so on. He's not long and long-winded like this one, you know. And he says, yeah, hey, this is not bad. And he comes again. And after about two months, he says to his wife, Darling, you want to come with me to church? And she comes to church with him. And the children come to church with him. And probably a year down the line, going to church regularly, he decides he wants to be a Christ follower. He wants to be a part of the elect. He wants to be a part of the household of Christ. He becomes a Christian. And it's almost as if the changes ratchet up a notch. For there's a change happening for him now from the inside out. And a year later, you can't recognize Mr. Man. Quality of his relationship with his wife has improved beyond recognition. The relationship with his children is like a brand new chapter. His life has changed radically because a friend that was willing to intervene, because of a church that was willing to help, because of a community group that was willing to work with that church, because of a counselor that was wise and guided him wisely, because of a relationship with God that transformed him from the 
inside out. And I wonder, friends, as we are watching, I wonder what we can do to reach a few manlies. I wonder what we will do to reach a few manlies. Or as we work together, the likelihood of that kind of change is much greater. May God give us the courage May God give us the wisdom not just to watch but to watch and take action. To watch in such a way that we are fulfilling our assigned task in reaching the world for the master. Shall we pray? I'm not so sure how that message grabbed you. I'm not so sure where you see yourself in this watching call. Maybe there's someone here this morning who is at the place where they need to make a decision to receive Christ as Savior and to follow Him as Lord. Maybe there's someone here this morning who is conscious that you are in an abusive relationship and those red flags that I read for you, just those, the four or five out of the eleven, you see them in your partner. The challenge for you is get out. If there's someone here this morning who is struggling with an anger problem and you take it out on the dog and the cat, you take it out on your children, you take it out on your girlfriend or your wife or your boyfriend, And the decision you need to make this morning is to go get help. Lord, we recognize this morning that we all are in a place that needs your touch, that needs your intervention. And we pray today that as you place us on watch, you may enable us to see what we need to see, that we may take the action that each of us needs to take to fulfill your mission, to make our community safer and violence free. Hear our prayer, Lord God. Let our cry come to you.